The story of the Sikhs. Truth is high, but still higher is truthful living. Why do we treat women inferiorly and look down upon them who give birth to kings and noblemen, written over 500 years ago in Sikh scripture? Those who have realized the truth are kings among men. Indeed, these earthly kings are no kings. Sweetness and humility are the essence of all good qualities. When you have neither your mother, nor father, nor son, nor friend, nor brother, God's name will always be with you as your helper. These are the words spoken by Guru Nanak, who taught the world universal love and brotherhood, selfless and truthful living, caring for the poor and unfortunate, devotion and love of God. The word Sikh means a disciple and a student of religion. Therefore, he or she continues to learn and improve his character throughout his life. Sikhism is not simply a religion, but a way of life, a faith of hope and optimism. It is a high spiritual life based on the principles laid down and practically demonstrated by the gurus in their lives on earth. The word guru is composed of the two terms gu, which means darkness, and ru, which means light. Therefore, guru is the light that dispels all darkness. From the very early days of his childhood, Guru Nanak was kind-hearted and loved the company of saints. He was very bright and learned all the languages of that time at a very young age. At the age of 11, according to family custom, a child is to wear a sacred thread. Guru Nanak refused to wear the sacred thread. He said, give me the sacred thread that never breaks or gets dirty. I want that sacred thread which after the death of man accompanies his soul to the next world. The priest was puzzled and said, I do not have such a thread. To which the guru said, take the cotton of kindness and spin the thread of contentment. Tie the knot of truth and virtue. I want to wear the sacred thread having these qualities. Everyone should wear such a thread. It was becoming clear to everyone that Nanak was a man of great nobility and spiritual powers. When he became a young man, his father wanted him to get a job. One day, he gave his son some money and told him to go to a neighboring town to buy some merchandise at a true bargain. During his travel to the town, he saw a group of holy men praying. They had no food and had not eaten for several days. The guru thought that hunger causes one of the greatest sufferings to human beings, and a noble thing would be to feed these holy men, and that would be a true bargain. So he traveled to the town and brought them food and water. After striking the true bargain, the guru came back and sat on the banks of a pond. His father, after finding out what his son had done, could not contain his anger and slapped him. However, Guru Nanak's sister said to her father, do not be angry with him because he is the light of God in your house. Guru Nanak went to Sultanpur where his sister lived and there he became a storekeeper. He worked with honesty, spoke politely, and if a poor hungry person would come to the store, the guru would offer food from his own share. He would work during the daytime and in the morning and evening, everyone would gather and listen to his hymns. His hymns were sung with great love and devotion. We should remember that this was occurring in a time when there was inequality of people and injustice to human beings. Guru Nanak preached in his hymns that there is only one God and that we can realize him not through the body, but through the mind. If our intentions are good, we can see him within ourselves. Joys and sorrows are the outcome of our actions. Sorrow should not depress us, and joy should not make us forget the Lord. Pride is a sickness, as it misleads man, and we should avoid it. Humility can overcome it. By remembering God, we shun pride. 
For over 20 years, Guru Nanak traveled thousands of miles in many countries in Asia and the Middle East on a mission to give spiritual comfort to the people. Wherever he went, his fame spread far and wide quickly. He was accompanied by Mardana, a Muslim, who played a musical instrument called a rabab and also had a beautiful voice in singing the hymns. The Hindus said Guru Nanak was the image of God and the Muslims said God spoke through him. In a town called Amnabad, the Guru stayed at the house of a poor carpenter. One day, the wealthy administrator of that town had invited all of the holy men to a feast. He also invited Guru Nanak, but the Guru did not accept his invitation. Being very irritated, he sent many persons to bring the Guru to the feast. When the Guru came, the wealthy man said angrily, you could take the food at the house of an untouchable, but did not come to my house even on invitation. The Guru replied, the poor man works hard to earn his bread and keeps his mind absorbed in the meditation of God, whereas you make your money through dishonest means and exploitation of poor people. Therefore, I cannot accept food bought with such money. There, Guru Nanak taught the people to work at making an honest living, whether they were rich or poor. Wherever he went, he did not ask anyone to change their religion. In his company, people realized that if you follow your religion truthfully, you can realize God. He told them that service of mankind is the true path of virtue and the followers of all religions can take to this task. He taught us to live in this world without being overly attached to worldly possessions. Like a lotus lives in the water, but out of it. Like a swan lives in the water, but out of it at the same time. When Guru Nanak passed away, a quarrel ensued. His Hindu followers wanted to cremate his remains, whereas his Muslim followers wanted to bury the body. Earlier, the guru had said, place flowers on both sides of the body. Whichever side the flowers continue to bloom can perform the last rites. It is said that the flowers offered by both the Hindus and the Muslims continue to bloom. It meant that Guru Nanak belonged to all communities. Guru Nanak chose as his successor a man called Lena, who had repeatedly proved his great devotion to God. He changed Lena's name to Angad, which means of my own body. Guru Nanak had two sons. However, they were not chosen to be the next gurus because they had failed the tests of humility. Guru Nanak was followed by nine other gurus over the next 200 years. All of the nine gurus which followed were chosen on the basis of their high spiritual knowledge and practice and had the same spirit of Guru Nanak. Thus, their bodies may have been different, but their spirit was the same. Each of the gurus led a householder's life and showed through their character the way a Sikh is to lead his or her life. Guru Angad, our second guru, encouraged all people to get an education, which was a privilege of only a few people of high caste in those days. He developed and promoted the written Punjabi language known as Gurmukhi, as it is written today. Guru Amardas, our third guru, taught his followers the spirit of selfless service, simple living and hard working. He abolished the practice of widows burning themselves. Our fourth guru, Guru Ramdas, established the sacred city of Amitsar. He continued the tradition of Langar, a free kitchen started by Guru Nanak, where food was eaten together by all those who came, regardless of their caste, religion, or status in society, something that was unheard of in those days. Our fifth guru, Guru Arjun, founded the most sacred shrine of the Sikhs, the Harmandir Sahib, also known as the Golden Temple. One of his many hymns includes the Sukhmani Sahib, recitation of which gives one peace of mind at any time of need. Guru Arjun compiled the holy scripture of the Sikhs, which includes the hymns of the previous, the story of the Sikhs. Truth is high, but still higher is truthful living. 
why do we treat women inferiorly and look down upon them who give birth to kings and noblemen? Written over 500 years ago in Sikh scripture. Those who have realized the truth are kings among men. Indeed, these earthly kings are no kings. Sweetness and humility are the essence of all good qualities. When you have neither your mother, nor father, nor son, nor friend, nor brother, God's name will always be with you as your helper. These are the words spoken by Guru Nanak, who taught the world universal love and brotherhood. Selfless and truthful living, caring for the poor and unfortunate, devotion and love of God. The word Sikh means a disciple and a student of religion. Therefore, he or she continues to learn and improve his character throughout his life. Sikhism is not simply a religion, but a way of life, a faith of hope and optimism. It is a high spiritual life based on the principles laid down and practically demonstrated by the gurus in their lives on earth. The word guru is composed of the two terms gu, which means darkness, and ru, which means light. Therefore, guru is the light that dispels all darkness. From the very early days of his childhood, Guru Nanak was kind-hearted and loved the company of saints. He was very bright and learned all the languages of that time at a very young age. At the age of 11, according to family custom, a child is to wear a sacred thread. Guru Nanak refused to wear the sacred thread. He said, give me the sacred thread that never breaks or gets dirty. I want that sacred thread which after the death of man accompanies his soul to the next world. The priest was puzzled and said, I do not have such a thread. To which the guru said, take the cotton of kindness and spin the thread of contentment. Tie the knot of truth and virtue. I want to wear the sacred thread having these qualities. Everyone should wear such a thread. It was becoming clear to everyone that Nanak was a man of great nobility and spiritual powers. When he became a young man, his father wanted him to get a job. One day, he gave his son some money and told him to go to a neighboring town to buy some merchandise at a true bargain. During his travel to the town, he saw a group of holy men praying. They had no food and had not eaten for several days. The guru thought that hunger causes one of the greatest sufferings to human beings, and a noble thing would be to feed these holy men, and that would be a true bargain. So he traveled to the town and brought them food and water. After striking the true bargain, the guru came back and sat on the banks of a pond. His father, after finding out what his son had done, could not contain his anger and slapped him. However, Guru Nanak's sister said to her father, do not be angry with him because he is the light of God in your house. Guru Nanak went to Sultanpur where his sister lived and there he became a storekeeper. He worked with honesty, spoke politely, and if a poor hungry person would come to the store, the guru would offer food from his own share. He would work during the daytime and in the morning and evening, everyone would gather and listen to his hymns. His hymns were sung with great love and devotion. We should remember that this was occurring in a time when there was inequality of people and injustice to human beings. Guru Nanak preached in his hymns that there is only one God and that we can realize him not through the body but through the mind. If our intentions are good, we can see him within ourselves. Joys and sorrows are the outcome of our actions. Sorrow should not depress us, and joy should not make us forget the Lord. Pride is a sickness, as it misleads man, and we should avoid it. Humility can overcome it. By remembering God, we shun pride. For over 20 years, 
Guru Nanak traveled thousands of miles in many countries in Asia and the Middle East on a mission to give spiritual comfort to the people. Wherever he went, his fame spread far and wide quickly. He was accompanied by Mardana, a Muslim, who played a musical instrument called a rabab and also had a beautiful voice in singing the hymns. The Hindus said Guru Nanak was the image of God and the Muslims said God spoke through him. In a town called Amnabad, the Guru stayed at the house of a poor carpenter. One day, the wealthy administrator of that town had invited all of the holy men to a feast. He also invited Guru Nanak, but the Guru did not accept his invitation. Being very irritated, he sent many persons to bring the Guru to the feast. When the Guru came, the wealthy man said angrily, you could take the food at the house of an untouchable, but did not come to my house even on invitation. The Guru replied, the poor man works hard to earn his bread and keeps his mind absorbed in the meditation of God, whereas you make your money through dishonest means and exploitation of poor people. Therefore, I cannot accept food bought with such money. There, Guru Nanak taught the people to work at making an honest living, whether they were rich or poor. Wherever he went, he did not ask anyone to change their religion. In his company, people realized that if you follow your religion truthfully, you can realize God. He told them that service of mankind is the true path of virtue and the followers of all religions can take to this task. He taught us to live in this world without being overly attached to worldly possessions. Like a lotus lives in the water, but out of it. Like a swan lives in the water, but out of it at the same time. When Guru Nanak passed away, a quarrel ensued. His Hindu followers wanted to cremate his remains, whereas his Muslim followers wanted to bury the body. Earlier, the guru had said, place flowers on both sides of the body. Whichever side the flowers continue to bloom can perform the last rites. It is said that the flowers offered by both the Hindus and the Muslims continue to bloom. It meant that Guru Nanak belonged to all communities. Guru Nanak chose as his successor a man called Lena, who had repeatedly proved his great devotion to God. He changed Lena's name to Angad, which means of my own body. Guru Nanak had two sons. However, they were not chosen to be the next gurus because they had failed the tests of humility. Guru Nanak was followed by nine other gurus over the next 200 years. All of the nine gurus which followed were chosen on the basis of their high spiritual knowledge and practice and had the same spirit of Guru Nanak. Thus, their bodies may have been different, but their spirit was the same. Each of the gurus led a householder's life and showed through their character the way a Sikh is to lead his or her life. Guru Angad, our second guru, encouraged all people to get an education, which was a privilege of only a few people of high caste in those days. He developed and promoted the written Punjabi language known as Gurmukhi, as it is written today. Guru Amardas, our third guru, taught his followers the spirit of selfless service, simple living and hard working. He abolished the practice of widows burning themselves. Our fourth guru, Guru Ramdas, established the sacred city of Amitsar. He continued the tradition of Langar, a free kitchen started by Guru Nanak, where food was eaten together by all those who came, regardless of their caste, religion, or status in society, something that was unheard of in those days. Our fifth guru, Guru Arjun, founded the most sacred shrine of the Sikhs, the Harmandir Sahib, also known as the Golden Temple. One of his many hymns includes the Sukhmani Sahib, recitation of which gives one peace of mind at any time of need. Guru Arjun compiled the holy scripture of the Sikhs, which includes the hymns of the previous, and along with his own hymns, he installed it in the Golden Temple as the first holy scripture of the Sikhs. Later on, 
Hymns were also added of the ninth guru, Guru Teg Bahadur, and collectively is called Guru Granth Sahib. To Sikhs worldwide, it is not a book, but a living guru, and therefore is kept with the utmost respect. It has the writings of not only the Sikh gurus, but also of Hindu and Muslim bhagats, or holy men, some of whom were of the lowest caste and therefore is a scripture of universal appeal. The Golden Temple in Amitsar was built in a very symbolic way. It has four doors which signifies that people from all corners of the world and all castes are welcome here. It is also situated lower than the surrounding ground, signifying humbleness. The foundation stone of the holiest Sikh shrine was laid by a Muslim, Miyamir. Golden Temple also faces Akal Tukat, the highest religious seat of the Sikh's faith, and directives from the Akal Tukat are binding to Sikhs worldwide. <laughs> the fifth guru's time, Sikhism had evolved their own language and culture. The popularity among masses was great, and this affected the ruler who wanted to put an end to this. Guru Arjan was tortured to death by having to sit on hot iron plates with hot sand poured over his body. He did not die in vain, for he preserved the truth and became the first of many Sikh martyrs. Our sixth guru, Guru Hargobind trained his followers in the art of self-defense. The guru wore two swords, which are called Miri, which signifies temporal power, and Piri, which signifies spiritual powers. There were many non-Sikhs in the army of the gurus. The gurus did not convert these soldiers, and mosques and temples were there for them so they could practice their faith truthfully. Our seventh guru, Guru Harai spread the message of the previous gurus by touring many places in Punjab. One day, he sent his son, Ram Rai, to Delhi, where to please the emperor, his son changed a word in the Guru Granth Sahib. The guru was so much displeased with his son that he did not wish to see him again. As Guru Granth Sahib was compiled under the direction of the gurus in their lifetime, it is an authentic scripture and cannot be changed. Our eighth guru, Guru Harkrishan, also is known as a child guru because he was only five when he assumed the leadership of the Sikh community. On his travels to Delhi, there was an epidemic of smallpox, and the guru brought health and happiness to many smallpox-stricken people. However, soon after reaching there, he fell ill and passed away. Today in New Delhi, there stands a temple known as Guru Dwara Bangla Sahib, where people from all corners of the world come when they are sick to receive the blessings and drink the sacred water so their sufferings may be alleviated. <laughs> In 1675, a group of Hindu holy men asked Guru Teg Bahadur, our ninth guru, to help them save their religion. They were being forced to become Muslims against their wishes. Guru Teg Bahadur went with several Sikhs to the king's court in Delhi. They were all put in prison and told to change their religion. Each of the Sikhs was tortured in front of the guru, but no one would give up their faith. 
the guru was also beheaded. Through his supreme deed, he preserved the rights of all people to practice their religion without fear. In 1699, our tenth and last living guru, Guru Gobind Singh, created the order of the Khalsa, which means pure. He called an assembly of the people of Anandpur in Punjab. Thousands had gathered there. The guru asked who was willing to die to preserve the truth. One man got up, and the guru took him inside a tent, and finally the guru came out alone with blood dripping from his sword. He asked the same four more times, and four other people got up one at a time. All of these people belong to different traditional castes, including the lowest caste. The congregation was not sure what was happening, and why did the guru demand the heads of five people? After the guru took the fifth man inside, he stayed longer in the tent. At last, he came out. His face was beaming with joy. He was followed by five Sikhs dressed exactly like him. Who were they? These were the same who had given their heads to the guru. Their appearance was exactly like the guru. These are called the Panj Piyare, or Five Beloved Ones. The guru took some water in a bowl. While saying prayers, he stirred this with kanda, a two-edged sword, and his wife added some sweet sugar to this, and this was called Amrit. With this, he called the five beloved ones his Khalsa. These beloved ones, who belong to all different castes, low and high, drank from the same vessel. This was unheard of. It shocked all of those who were present at the time. The Guru said that all of those who take Amrit became his lions, and therefore all male Sikhs have Singh in their name, which means lion, and Kaur for females, which means princess. After that, the Guru bowed in front of the five beloved ones and begged them to give him the Amrit as well. This showed he did not consider himself to be above anyone and showed humility. That day, thousands of people, including men and women, old and young, healthy and sick, rich or poor, belonging to any caste, took Amrit and became equal and pure in the Khalsa. Guru Gobind Singh declared a code of conduct for his Sikhs. A Sikh is to be a saint and a soldier, to be humble and kind. A Sikh is not to smoke, use any intoxicants, drink alcohol, commit adultery. A Sikh is to believe in one God and not to worship statues, idols, and get preoccupied in rituals. He or she is to earn an honest living and share this with others less fortunate. Women are to be treated equally. Female infanticide and widows burning themselves are strictly prohibited. Thus was born the Khalsa, a nation of saint soldiers, a brotherhood in which all are equal. Sikhs won many battles against tyrant rulers, but never plundered their villages. In one of the battles, some soldiers complained to the guru that one of his followers was treating the wounded of the enemy and giving them water and medicine. Bhai Kanyeya was summoned to the guru. He said to the guru, I see the wounded human beings as your light, and thus I am helping them. The guru was very pleased and said, You are my true Sikh, who sees all human beings as same. The Khalsa Sikhs must also observe the following articles of faith or symbols, popularly known as the five Ks. Case or hair. Kanga or comb. Kacha or short. Karla, an iron bangle, kirpan, or sword. A turban is the most visible mark of the Sikhs, especially a male. It is there to keep the hair neat and tidy. A turban is a symbol of royalty, and in Sikhs also symbolizes equality. It ensures visibility and encourages commitment to one's belief and responsibility to others in a society. To Sikhs, a turban is not a hat and is not removed where traditionally hats are removed. To us, 
wearing and not removing a turban is a sign of respect to others. Guru Gobind Singh was the last living guru of the Sikhs. Before he passed away in 1708, he installed the holy scripture, Guru Granth Sahib, as the living guru. He said to the Sikhs, I shall remain in the Khalsa, and if you want to see me, just look at yourself in the mirror. After he passed away, the Sikhs have undergone several holocausts and have had to endure unspeakable atrocities. At one point in the 18th century, there was a price on every Sikh's head, but they survived because the gurus have put them on the path of the truth. The Sikh women have also had an important role in the Khalsa Punt, from their role in propagating the guru's teaching to their brave heroism in battles. To celebrate the birth of Khalsa, parades are held in many cities of the world. This one is in Toronto, Canada. <laughs> The Sikh religion does not preach against any other religion. It asks for you to look at the goodness of your faith and follow it truthfully. We all pray differently. However, God accepts our prayers when we offer them sincerely. <laughs> Sikhs frequently get mistaken for people of other cultures and religions, as a turban is worn by many people of the world. However, please note that only the Sikhs have a full beard and mustache, and the hair underneath the turban is uncut. Sikh boys have their hair knotted neatly to form a juda, and frequently it is covered by a cloth called patka, or dustar. Sometimes they can be mistaken as girls, and hopefully this documentary will help clarify some of these misunderstandings. The daily life of an ideal Sikh is as follows. A true Sikh rises before the night's end and turns his thought to God's name, to charity and holy bathing. He speaks humbly, and humbly he walks. He wishes everyone well, and he is joyed to give away gifts from his hand. He sleeps but little, and little does he eat and talk. Thus, he received the Guru's true teaching. He lives by the labor of his hands, and he does good deeds. However eminent he might become, he demonstrates not himself. He sings God's praises in company of holy men. Such company he seeks night and day. Upon the word is his mind fixed and he delights in the Guru's will. Unenticed, he lives in this world of enticement. We would like to show you how male Sikhs get ready, as we are frequently asked whether we sleep with a turban on or how do we tie a turban. A young boy combs his hair neatly and makes a knot on top of his head, which is called Judah. He then ties a patka or dustar, as this young boy is doing. 
the color of the cloth has no significance. There is no specific age when a male Sikh must start to wear a turban. But in North America, he usually makes a change from a dustar to a turban upon entering high school. The turban, which as you can see here, could be of any different color, is neatly folded and is wrapped around the head as is being done by this gentleman. like to show you how families worship in a Sikh temple where services usually occur on Sundays. But in places like Toronto, where there is a significant population of Sikhs, there are services held every morning and every evening as well. The Sikhs' place of worship is called Gudwara, which literally means the door to the Guru. Anyone is welcome in the Sikhs' temple. Nishan Sahib, a ceremonial flag of the Sikhs is seen outside of the temple. When the parishioners arrive, shoes are removed and the head is covered. These are done as measures of cleanliness and also to show respect in the presence of the Guru Granth Sahib, which is housed within the Gurudwara. After the shoes are removed, the parishioners then wash their hands and walk towards the room where the Guru Granth Sahib is housed. We bow in front of the Guru Granth Sahib. This symbolizes humility. In the Sikh temple, there are no idols or statues. The gurus did not want portraits drawn of themselves and people praying to them. The Sikhs pray to receive the teachings of Sri Guru Granth Sahib so they can practice in their daily lives. Generally, women sit on one side of the room and men sit on the other side. As the Holy Scripture is written in a poetic form, it can be either read or sung. On special occasions, singing is mixed with lectures, poems, or other compositions, highlighting events from the Sikh history. Here, the kirtan is being performed by a visiting Ragi Jata. The services are concluded with ardas the prayer in which the Sikhs ask for God's blessing in granting peace, prosperity, and protection to all of mankind, and not just the Sikhs. After the conclusion of the service, a passage is read from the Guru Granth Sahib. <laughs> Prashad is served to everyone present in the hall, no matter what their religion, caste, color, or creed may be. It is a sweet pudding made out of flour, sugar, and butter, and signifies the blessings received by everyone present. This tradition was started by Guru Nanak. Afterwards, everyone sits together on the ground and eats a meal prepared by members of the congregation. The philosophy of universal equality is shown here in that everyone sits at the same place. No matter whether they be kings or a poor person, they all sit side by side and eat the same food prepared by volunteers. We encourage you to visit a Sikh Gurdwara in your community. Today there are Sikh Gurdwaras in practically every major city of the world. Please remember not to bring any alcohol or tobacco inside the temple. The migration of Sikhs to North America began in the late 1800s. The first immigrants were the Sikh soldiers and their friends who were in the British Army. The next group to arrive were the people who had read steamship company ads inviting workers to North America. One incident that stands out in the history books is the story of Komagata Maru. This was a ship chartered to bring the Sikhs to Canada in 1914. Before the ship even reached its destination, Canadians were thinking of a way to send it back. The passengers had bought a shipment of coal, which they planned to sell to earn their entrance fee. The government, however, said that they could not sell the coal until all of the passengers had paid and entered Canada. The passengers on the ship began running out of food and water and becoming ill with many illnesses. Finally, after many months, the ship left to return home after waiting three and a half months in port, during which time many Sikhs died. 
North Americans were surprised that Sikhs, who once had very high positions in the military, were now doing manual labor jobs and were not ashamed. This is because of the emphasis in our religion that work, no matter what type it is, should be done with honesty, integrity, and sincerity. So Sikhs were proud of their hard work despite being menial. The North Americans also saw that there were not very many unemployed Sikhs, and the ones who were not working were being taken care of by other Sikhs instead of being a burden to the government. Because of the struggles the first immigrants faced, Sikhs were determined to work hard and educate their children. Over the years, conditions have improved, and there have been Sikhs elected to the U.S. Congress, as well as the House of Commons in the Canadian National Parliament. Today, there are approximately 20 million Sikhs worldwide, with over 3 million outside of India. In India, they are only 2% of the population, and the majority live in a northern state called Punjab. In North America today, we see the Sikhs in various professions. We see the Sikhs as doctors, lawyers, engineers, teachers, and in various forms of businesses. In addition to working hard, physical fitness is also emphasized to keep the body healthy. Sikhs are involved in all the local sports, and here in North America, you may see the Sikhs playing tennis, volleyball, or see them swimming or playing basketball. A principle very important in the Sikh faith is Van Kichakna, also known as service or seva. Sikhs generally do seva with either tan, which means body, man, which means mind, and dan, which means wealth. Many people donate money to their favorite charity, but money is not the only way to lend a hand. One can also give up one's time and energy to benefit others. This is called tan. For example, many Sikhs volunteer at homeless shelters to feed the poor. You may see Sikh physicians doing volunteer work at various clinics and hospitals. Some Sikhs donate their blood at the Gurdwara's annual blood drive. Other ways Sikhs give up their time is by the annual summer camps that are held to educate the children and youth. The five virtues in Sikhism are truth, contentment, patience, faith, and compassion. In Sikhism, there are five vices that one must avoid. These are kam, which means lust, krod, which is hatred or anger, lob, which means greed, mo, which means attachment to worldly things, hunkar, which means egoism or self-pride. In the Sikhs' faith, it is the inner qualities and along with the outer appearance that makes a person a Sikh. In recent history, one true Sikh was Bhagat Puran Singh. Puran Singh's mission started in 1924, when as a teenager, he adopted a crippled child. This was the beginning of a mission to serve the handicapped people of India and Pakistan. His resources were meager, and many times he had to carry the crippled child on his back from place to place. He was subjected to public ridicule. He carried on his activities while walking barefoot, half-clothed, day and night, in scorching heat and bitter cold, in rain and in dust storms, undeterred by adversities and undaunted by criticism. He was a friend of the helpless, a ready nurse for a patient with any disease. He made not the slightest distinction on the basis of caste, creed, or community, caring only for the person in need of his service. His one-man mission became an institution called Pingalwara. The Pingalwara is a temple of God without any representation or idols of any religion. The only symbol of God in Pingalwara is the destitute bodies, the helpless man, woman, or child. His approach seemed to be that the soul in all man is the same spark of the divine, and therefore the love and the service of the common man is the truest form of worship. Over the past 50 years, he had provided service to the destitute, homeless, helpless people. 
he did not crave personal recognition, although he had been inundated with it. And in fact, he shunned public attention for his efforts because the truest form of charity in Sikhism is charity which is done without ego or self-pride. Bhagat Puran Singh expired in 1992, but his legacy lives on as the souls of the true Sikhs never die. The light continues to glow in the hearts and minds of millions everywhere. There are two greetings which the Sikhs use when they meet one another. The first one is, Wahe Guru Ji Ka Khalsa, Wahe Guru Ji Ki Fateh, which means Khalsa is God's and the victory is God's. The second greeting is Sat Sri Akal, which means God is the truth. We hope this brief documentary has helped in clearing up some of the misunderstandings the Sikhs face in their day-to-day -day life because of their appearance. We hope you have enjoyed watching A Sikh's Way of Life, a life based on a belief in one God, equality of all mankind, living a truthful and humble life, earning an honest living, and sharing this with others less fortunate than themselves. The next time you see Sikhs, don't be shy. Go and say, Satri Akal, you'll have made a friend. <laughs>